sinful nature. There are certainly differences in, in a lot of different ways. But when it comes to our core convictions and who we are and what we do, we must be diverse. Over the last couple of days, my heart's been broken to watch the news and what's taken place in Charlottesville, what started with uh, white supremacist rallies and then counter protests, and a man drives his car into a crowd of people, and uh, people are dead. Police officers have died while trying to uh, sort things out and, and watch things, and, and it shows some of that racial unrest in our country, a lack of unity. The elections in November show that our country is probably split right down the middle, on, at least on some lines. And it, within our country, I think we see a lack of unity. But let it never be said of those of us in the church that when we walk in here, there is also a lack of unity. If people can't get along inside this place, where in the world do we think they have a, any chance of getting along? We expect people, as, as awful as it is, we expect people outside the church to be divided. People can be divided for a hundred different things outside the church. But when we come in here, we are the ones called out together, called out by the same God to live the same life, believing the same things. We ought to be, we ought to be united. If this church is going to be one that soars, we must be united with each other. Again, I'm not saying there's no room for differences of opinion. This morning in our Sunday school class, we, we talked about some different things, and we had a little discussion, and, and you know, some people believe differently on some things, and that's okay especially as we talk about things like the book of Revelation, or we talk about things like when's the rapture going to be, or end times prophecy. We can have difference of, of opinion on those things. But where we must be united is on those core convictions. How many ways to heaven are there? There's none except through Jesus Christ. We are united in that. That, that ought to be something that brings us together. What breaks my heart, though, is to see so many different subdivided churches you know what I mean by subdivided churches? Instead of just being the church, we have a white church and a black church. We have a cowboy church and a biker church. I mean, why do we need to subdivide ourselves? Why can't we just be the church? It would be like, have, I mean, where do we draw the line? We have a Gamecock church and a Clemson church. Is it ever going to come to that? You said, that, well, that would be ridiculous. Well, I mean, what if we had a Ford church and a Chevy church? And maybe you belong to some, you know, minority group in there. Well, I'm a, I'm a Ram guy. You know, but whatever. Wh why are we going to subdivide ourselves that much? Can't we just agree that we are the church of Jesus Christ? We don't need to be so subdivided. Boy, I wish we could just come together and worship. Because do we think that's how it's going to be in heaven? Do we think in heaven there's going to be a, a white congregation and a black congregation and a, a Ford group and a Chevy group in heaven? No, we're all going to be worshiping around the throne. And if we're all going to worship together up there, then shouldn't we be able to worship together down here? And I believe this. I believe for the ones down here that say, well, I can't worship with them. If you can't worship with someone else down here, I'm not so convinced we make it up there. Now, I don't see how a person that excludes others or keeps the message of Christ to themselves and says, well, this is for me, but it's not for them. They, they need to go over there, and they can stick together over there. Boy, I don't see how a Christian can adopt that attitude. But we must be united together. If we're going to be a church that soars, we've got to be on the same page. While we can disagree about some things and still get along, there are a couple of core things that we must unite around. So three things this morning, three ways that we must be united. The first thing, number one, is we must have the same mind. As the church, and let's make it personal, as the church here at Putman, and I know we have some people that came for a baby dedication and maybe y'all go to different churches. That's great. You know, when you go back to your church, you make sure that you are united with the people where you worship. But, but for those of us here today, as the church at Putman, we must have the same mind. We see in Philippians 2.5, Paul said these words. Paul said, to let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Paul does not say in that verse that we are commanded to have the same skin color, the same social status, the same education level, the same background, but he said we are to have the same mind. We should be like-minded. And more specifically, that mind should be the same mind found in Christ. When Jesus walked on this earth, how did he operate? How did he think? What did he do? And we must work to adopt that mindset into our lives. And, and that's how we make up our mind about a lot of things today, isn't it? We, we filter everything through having the mind of Christ. Whether some issue comes up and we think, well, how would Jesus have responded in this situation? How would Jesus have addressed this person? What would Jesus have done 
if he were standing right here today. We must work to have the mind of Jesus. Now, I know we're never going to do that perfectly down here. But you remember those WWJD bracelets from, from back in the day? Anybody ever have one of those? I remember I, I had several of them. WWJD, if you don't remember that, maybe you're too young or, or maybe you don't remember. The WWJD, what would Jesus do? And so you wear it as a bracelet and, and maybe you're about to you know, retaliate to somebody in anger and you look down and you see WWJD, oh, what would Jesus do? Well, Jesus wouldn't lose his temper and scream at that person. You know, or maybe you're about to do something, you look down and you say, oh, wait, yeah, what would Jesus do if he were here today? That's what Paul's talking about. Having this same mindset that Jesus had. How do we know what kind of mindset Jesus had? Well, let's read the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let's see what he did. Let's see what he said. Let's see how he said it. And let's pray that God would give us that same mindset that Jesus had. What does it look like if we have the same mind as Jesus? Well, in context, we see what Paul's talking about there in Philippians 2. If you'd like to turn there in your Bibles, you can. I've read verse 5, but, but we'll read a few more here lest we take one verse and then begin to make our own application. Let's see what Paul was talking about. In Philippians 2, Paul says in verse 3, he says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. I know that's an old King James word, but he continues, But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. So look not every man on his own things or his own needs, but every man also on the things of others. So let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ, who being in the form of God, or in very nature, he was God. He did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, and he took upon him the form of a servant, and he was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and he became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. What would you say the overriding context of this passage is? Having the mind of Christ, but if you could describe Jesus based on these verses in one word, what would it be? How about humility? Do you see the humility of Jesus keep coming up in this passage? He humbled himself. He made himself of no reputation. He could have announced his coming as the king of the universe with a parade and trumpets blaring, everybody saying, the king of kings is here, but no, where was he born? in a manger among the livestock. He was somebody who did not come with a great reputation, but he came with lowliness of mind. Paul says, so don't just look to meet your own needs, but you look to meet the needs of others. Isn't that what Jesus did? What about going to the cross? Did he meet his own needs on the cross, or did he look to meet the needs of others? I'm glad that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came in his humility and he died so that our sins can be forgiven. If Jesus came only to meet his own needs, we would have no hope of heaven, would we? If Jesus just came and said, well, I'm here to be comfortable, guys. I'm here to live life and enjoy it and and look out for number one. He wouldn't have gone to the cross. He wouldn't have worn that crown of thorns. He wouldn't have been mocked or spit at or tortured or beaten, and he would not have been crucified, and you and I could never have our sins forgiven. But he didn't come to take care of his own needs. He didn't come to look out for number one. He came because he he thought our needs were more important than his comforts. And so he gave it all up in heaven, humbled himself, and he came here. And Paul says, let this same mind be found in you, in me as Christians. In other words, Jesus is our example of humility as somebody who did not come to be served, but to serve. Think about this, church. You want to be a church that soars? Could you imagine if every one of us comes in here today with this mindset, not about me, but about somebody else today? Not about getting my needs met, but about meeting the needs of someone else. Not about me getting recognition, not about my pat on the back, not about everybody acknowledging me today, but how can I be a blessing to everyone else? Paul says to not look on your own needs, but to look every man on the needs of others. And he says to let each esteem others better than themselves. Meaning this, you walk into a room and you walk in and say, look at all these people and I'm the least important one in here today. 
I'm going to esteem each one of you as more important than me. I'm going to view each one of you as somebody that I'm sent here today to serve. Not all of you here to serve me, but me here to serve all of you. Could you imagine if that's what church was? Could you imagine if 130 or so people walk in here today and every one of us puts ourselves last and everyone first? I've walked in here today to be a blessing to somebody, to be a blessing to many people. Man, the sky would be the limit if that is the way that we entered this place. But what happens in the average church? You walk in and he's in my seat. I've been sitting there for the last 20 years. That's my seat. Man, did I strike a nerve with somebody there? Someone's got a guilty conscience. But you, know, but you think about that. The person that says that's my seat, whose needs are they thinking about? Their own. I heard an evangelist actually reading his book right now, and he talked about how he went into a church, and he says they were about to start, and he saw a lady getting up and leaving the service, and she was fuming. And he asked about it later, and at a revival, she was mad that a visitor had come and sat in her seat. And she got up and left the revival. Talk about missing the point. And possibly an unsaved person is in your seat. You ought to say, glory to God, I hope they get saved today. But instead she's saying, that's my seat, I'm out of here. But you walk into a church, is it about having my needs met? But the longer I'm in church, the more I hear things like that. Well, nobody talked to me. I was sick last week and nobody called me. And it's all about me and my needs. Are my needs being met? Well, I'm not here to have my needs met. I would be here to make sure that yours are. And if you have that same attitude, you don't care if maybe a need or two goes unmet in your own life because you're not nearly as concerned about yourself as you are those around you. Let us each esteem other better than themselves. I can't think of a better purpose for the church than to look to meet the needs of other people because people come in here from many different scenarios today. As Alicia said a minute ago, you don't know somebody that got a bad doctor's report this week. You don't know somebody that got laid off this week. Somebody who's got their heart broken this week. We don't know what might be going on in the lives of someone. So let's look to be a need meter. Let's look to be a need meeting church. We need to make sure that we have the mind of Jesus found present within us. The first way that we should be united together today is that we should be people that have the same mind. But number two, we should have the same mission. We need to make sure that we have the same mission. Paul, in the book of 1 Corinthians, and in, in, uh, um, is it Romans? I'm sorry. Mine went blank. Give me a second. I think it's Romans chapter. No, it is 1 Corinthians 12. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about the parts of the body, and, and he gives this whole uh, fictitious scenario where the parts of the body begin to argue with each other. Well, if the, if the hand says, well, because I'm not the foot, I must not be important. And the foot says, well, yeah, well, I'm not the hand, so I must not be important. How ridiculous would that be? But Paul says in the church is made up of many members, but we're all one body. See, we are the body of Christ, but we are made up of many unique individuals. People that bring different experiences to the table. People that bring different backgrounds to the table. And yet we all are one church. People that bring different gifts and abilities to the table. And yet we all are our one church. Just as this morning, we've seen people playing their guitars. This morning, we've seen people playing the keys. We've seen people using their voices and leading us. We've seen people, or maybe you don't see them, but people are back there pushing buttons that I don't know what they do. This morning, people have been using the gifts that they have for the benefit of the body. This morning, people have been teaching Sunday school classes. There are people that just have the gift of greeting with a smile on their face and, and caring about people. There have been people that are using the gifts they have, many unique members, but one body. Why, we have the same mission. As a body has a couple of hundred unique parts, but the body, your physical human body, it has one mission. The hand and the foot may be very, very different, but they work together for the same purpose, a functioning body. The heart and the liver may be very, very different, but they work together for the same purpose. Which one would you rather live without, your heart or your liver? Without many miracles, you can't live without either. They're very different, but they're part of the same body. They have the same mission. And so we as the church, though we are many, though we are unique, though we bring different gifts and abilities, we must work together with the same mission. It's a great commission what Jesus told his disciples to go and make disciples, teach them, baptize them, equip them, train them up the way they should go. That's our mission. And then the great command to love God with all your heart 
and to love on other people, treat them the way that you want to be treated. That's our mission. How we go about accomplishing that may look different for different people. Whether you stand up and teach in your Sunday school class, it might look different than the one that plays their guitar. We go about it from different ways, but we do it for the same mission. So do we look around and say, yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm not a teacher. I can't stand up there in front of anybody, so I'm not that important. Well, if you're the one back there turning on the microphone so the teacher can be heard, no, you are just as important. If you're the person that's passing out bulletins and greeting people with a smile, if you're doing that, maybe making somebody's day, maybe setting the tone from the start, no, you're just as important. If you're the one that's using your voice to sing praises to God, you know, you're just as important. We can't begin to rank people as we cannot begin to rank body parts. Now, we might have a few body parts we can live without. But at the end of the day, even if we subtract any one of them, take a single pinky toe and try to live without it. It throws off your balance, doesn't it? We can't subtract one part of our body without something beginning to suffer. And if God has given you a gift to use in this church as part of our mission and you choose not to use that gift or you choose to maybe come just once a month or so and I'll use my gift when I'm there, well, the whole body begins to suffer. And so we've got to make sure that we do what we are supposed to do. What if there was a civil war among the body parts? What if parts of the body began to fight with each other? What if the hand really did say, well, I don't like those feet and I'm going to fight against the feet? And then the feet start kicking back. Well, I'm going to fight. I used a pun there. I'm going to, I'm going to fight against the hands. And, and your body begins to fight with each other. You said that would be ridiculous. Do we do that within the body of Christ? As members of the body, do we fight with each other? I, I was talking about things, parts of your body you, you can't live without. Um, one thing you can live without is one of your kidneys. Alicia has three kidneys. She has the two she was born with that are shriveled up and don't work. And then she has her transplanted kidney. But you know, as long as she has that third kidney, she will take her immunosuppression. Uh, she will take pills to keep her body from fighting off what it views as an intruder. There's a kidney that she was not born with, and her body doesn't like it there. And so she has to take pills every day to stop her own body from fighting off this miracle third kidney that she has. And, and it's a shame when your body tries to fight off something that's good, right? Right? If you could just explain to the body, no, 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 listen up, listen up. I know that kidney wasn't born there, but it's doing her a favor. Y'all just relax. Accept the new kidney, okay? It's one of us now. It's part of the team. But her body doesn't understand that. And if she misses a single dose of her pills, a single dose, her body can fight off that kidney and destroy it. But that, that's what happens, I think, within the body of Christ. We have somebody come in and say, wait, 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 wait. You're not, you don't look like us. You hadn't been here as long as we've been here. We know what you've been through. You think you want to come down here and be part of us? But if we can just explain, listen, they're part of the team now. They have something valuable to contribute now. Let's not fight them off. Let's welcome them in with open arms. Because without what they bring to the table, we could be sick. But God has sent them here to contribute as part of the mission, as part of the body. They're one of us. How sad if a church would fight off one of its own. A civil war within the church, fighting off one of our own helpful and useful members. And you might say, well, I know what they're really like. I'm just glad they're here. I can't think of a single situation in which we would ever run off a person that comes to church. We would ever tell somebody, no, you're not welcome here. Why don't you try the church down the road, but you can't come in here with us today. I can't think of a single situation that it would ever be for the best to tell somebody they weren't welcome here. Now, we could talk about a wolf in sheep's clothing that maybe they've been warned, and, and that's another story. But I can't think of a person that would walk in here today where we'd say, you know what, ushers, stop them, don't let them in here. But it happens. I hear about churches running people off for that all the time. Let us not be a church that's engaged in a civil war. I love the quote from President Ronald Reagan. I was a toddler when he said it. I don't remember it. But you may well remember the day that he said, Mr. Gorbachev, what did he say? You know it tear down this wall. The boldness with which he said it and what all was accomplished afterwards, that, that was a statement that more or less ended the Cold War. I mean, you think about what was once East and West Germany that is now just Germany today. Once where half the country 
was spoiled by communism. They're now a contributing democracy today. No perfect country, there are none. But you think about what Germany is now versus where they were when President Reagan said those words and how he almost didn't say them. The speech writers were saying, no, 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 you can't put that in there. He hand wrote it in his notes and said, add this to it. They said, we're not going to add it. And so he, he wrote it in there, and then his chief of staff again, Mr. President, you can't say that. He said, no, I'm going to say it. And then he finally got there, and in his final version of his speech, the line still was not there. And against what everybody said, he delivered that line anyway. Tear down this wall. They said, the President of the United States has no business meddling in their country. You know, you don't need to say that. That could be offensive. That could turn people off. That could make them hate America. But he understood what was best for everybody, for the world at large, was for the Berlin Wall to come down. And so he stood there and he said, tear down this wall. Why am I saying that? I want to read a verse to you from Ephesians chapter 4. You don't have to, uh, chapter 2, you don't have to turn there. I just want to read Ephesians 2.14. Here's what Jesus can do in the life of the church. It says that he, Jesus, he is our peace who has made two into one. And he has torn down the wall of separation between us. Jesus is our peace. He's turned two into one, and he tore down the wall of separation. What does that mean? He's our peace. Well, Jesus comes to bring peace. Now, in some cases, you can say, well, wait, doesn't the Bible say that he came to bring division? Jesus necessarily divides, right? If, if you believe that there are 20 ways to heaven and I believe there's one, there's going to be some division there. Jesus said, look, people are going to be divided on this issue. Some of you understand that. You go home to lunch today or to Thanksgiving in November, and you've got relatives that will not speak to you because you believe in Jesus. If you were a Buddhist, they'd love you. If you were a Scientologist, they'd love you. If you were an atheist, they'd love you. But because you believe that Jesus is the sole way to heaven, they won't have anything to do with you. Some of you know what I'm talking about, that, that division that comes. But by and large, Jesus came to bring peace, peace with each other here, and peace between mankind and God. But it says that Jesus can make two into one. He can take the black church and the white church and he can make them the church. He can take the cowboy church and the biker church and make them the church. Yes, he can take the Carolina church and the Clemson church and he can make them the church. Jesus can make two groups into one because when we have the same mind and we have the same mission, we can be united. He came to make two groups one, but look what he came to do, to tear down the wall of separation. Is there a wall of separation in your life today? Is there a wall down this middle aisle where those over here won't associate with those over there or vice versa? You've built up a wall and you say, well, we don't talk to them. And you teach your kids, no, 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 we're not friends with them. Our families and their families, we don't get along. Is there a wall of separation among any of us today? Because let me be very blunt with you. If we're going to be a church that soars, there can be no wall of separation between any of us. We cannot build up walls between fellow church members. We cannot build up walls between those with which we are supposed to be united with the same mission and the same mindset. How can we say, oh yeah, yeah, we all have the same mission. We're all called by the same God, called out with a purpose, and yet we've built up a wall between us. We don't talk to them. We don't hang out with them. We're going to have an ice cream social tonight. We're going to make sure we stay as far away from them as possible. How can a church thrive when we have walls built up? How can a church soar if we haven't forgiven somebody here? How can we soar as a church if we're bitter or angry with somebody else? We're holding on to a grudge from 20 years ago, and we don't even remember what happened. All we remember is we're supposed to hate them. How can a church soar when walls are built up. Look, I understand in the past as a church that, that has 200 years of history, I understand that good things have happened in this church's past, and, and I understand that with two centuries of history that bad things have happened in this church's past. But if there are some things that we're holding on to in anger or bitterness that we won't let go of today, and we've allowed walls to be built up, then I look to you the same way that President Reagan said, tear down this wall. It might not be popular, and you might say, that's not your business, or you don't know what happened between us and them, and you weren't even here back then. I don't care if it's popular or incorrect. I'm going to say it anyway. Tear down the wall, because this church cannot be united if we are divided among ourselves. How can we soar 
if we can't even get along. If you go to offer your gift and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift and go and be restored to your brother. Then come back, Jesus says, and offer your gift. I don't care how much money you threw in the offering plate today. If you have a grudge with somebody else, Jesus says, I'm not interested in it. I don't care what act of service you gave today. If you have unforgiveness in your heart, Jesus says, I don't care. Just like with Amos last week. Yeah, you're burning your incense. You're observing your feast. You're having your festivals, but I'm not listening because you're unrighteous and your hearts are far from me. We've got to be people that are willing to forgive, to tear down any walls, grab a sledgehammer like they did in Berlin that day and begin to knock that wall down. Growing up in Orlando, we had under glass because I'm a nerd. I had a piece of the Berlin Wall in like a little display case that sat on top of my computer desk. A piece of the Berlin Wall that would forever symbolize East and West Germany, but being torn down and now just being Germany. Maybe we need to do that same thing today. To tear down what wall divides us so we're not maybe like left twigs and right twigs. You see those commercials? But we're not left church and right church. We're not this family or that family. We are just the church. Let's tear down the walls that divide us today. And to your credit, church, let me say this. The first time we came here was February 2016, Valentine's Day. I preached here Sunday morning, and I felt like I had no sooner said amen than the parking lot was totally empty. I came back and preached that night, same thing. We said amen, good night, y'all are dismissed, and it seemed like the lights were off and the doors were locked before I could step down from here. Man, just cleared out in a hurry. And I remember talking to some people, is it always like this? And someone said, yeah, you know, some people, they, they don't want to face other people in the parking lot. They, they'd rather just get out of here and leave. Well, how is it now? Sunday night, I can leave church. I can stick around and lock up myself. I can go to town, eat at Taco Bell, and come back. And Tim and Teresa are still out there talking to Russ and Kay in the parking lot. And so I know that things are changing, and I know that progress is being made, and, and it's a sign of a healthy church that we can go out there today and see people are sticking around, and they're talking, and they're laughing, and they're fellowship, and they're saying, hey, let's do ice cream socials. Hey, let's eat on Wednesday night. Hey, let's do these things where the church can come together. That is a good sign of life in the church. And so I commend you for that, and we must build on that, and we must understand that that is not necessarily an end. That is a good sign of health and progress. But if there's still work to be done, let's make sure that we're still doing the work. If God has laid someone on our heart, let's make sure that we go to them today, tear down any walls, and be united with them. If we're going to be a church of that source, to be united, we must have the same mind. We must have the same mission. And then finally, we must have the same motive. Our motivation. Why we do what we do. And I said this point last week, but I'll reiterate it. Not just what we do, but why we do what we do. It must be for the right reasons. In 1 Corinthians 10.31, Paul said, Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, you do it all to the glory of God. Whatever you do, you do it for the glory of God and you're going to do it well. You're going to do it right. And if every one of us does what we do, not so man will notice, not for the pat on the back, not in hopes that they build a plaque for us or name a building after us when we're gone, but we do it for the glory of God, we're going to be in great shape. Whatever we do, whatever our act of service, however we conduct ourselves, let us do it for the glory of God. How you teach your class, you do it for the glory of God. How you sing, not like a sour puss, but with joy on your face. Do it for the glory of God. How you fellowship, how you greet each other, how you give, not just when the plates come by, but how you give your time, how you give your talents, how you give. Let's do it all for the glory of God. And I'm not just talking about here on Sundays, but when you leave and you go to work and you say, well, my boss man's a jerk. Well, don't work for him. You work for God. And you go to school and you say, my teacher is unfair. My teacher's too hard on me. Well, don't study for your teacher. You study for God. And you say, my parents don't understand me or my kids are rebellious. Don't do it for them. Do it for the glory of God. And as you run your errands, as you go to the stores, you cook dinner and sweep your kitchen floors. Let's do it all for the glory of God. And if we conduct our lives this way, everything we do for for God's glory, it will spill over into what we do when we come to church. And that is how we are called to live. Worship is not just what or how we sing on Sundays. Worship is how we live and do we do it all to the glory of God. What, whatever you do, eat or drink, 
what you do when you come here, let's do it for the glory of God. If we have the same mind,